Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. May Elise Cannon. Today is Saturday, September 21st. Today is day 351 since October 7th. Greetings from Seoul, South Korea. Um, I'm here for the fourth Lausanne Congress. Um, it begins this weekend um, uh, in the area. Thousands of Christians from around the world are coming together in a shared commitment to stand as one, to declare and display Christ together. One of the goals for this gathering is to look ahead toward 2050 with the need for a comprehensive, coordinated, and collaborative global mission as a part of the global church. And I hope a critical part of our time together as we're gathered from, I don't know if it's every continent, but almost every continent, my hope is that we'll talk um, not only about the Middle East, but specifically about what's happening in Gaza and that we'll work together um, against war and violence and death and the killing of so many civilians, including children. And I know that a lot of our partners um, from the Middle East, partners from Churches for Middle East Peace um, are here, and so I'm eager to meet with them um, in person. I'll go from here to the Middle East, um, but I'd encourage you to check out the website if it's of interest, congress.laz. Uh, Lausanne.org. In terms of the last 24 hours, it's probably not 24 hours because I lost or gained or something a lot of hours. I'm traveling from Seattle to here. Um, it's late at night, uh, soul time on Saturday evening. But um, in terms of what happened in Israel during the day on Saturday and uh, the occupied Palestinian territories, news from Gaza, I just feel like this is on repeat. It's like you could say the same thing and just change the numbers, change the neighborhood, change the refugee camp. But um, Haaretz reported that the health ministry has indicated um, at least 22 people were killed in an attack on a school. This was in the Zaytun neighborhood. It was in Gaza City. Um, 30 others were injured. And the Israeli army said that the reason why the Air Force struck was because there was a Hamas compound in the building. That's what's on repeat. I mean, all of this is just on repeat. We also have been talking about the ways that food is being used as a weapon in this war. And I wanted to be sure that you don't miss this. Humanitarian groups have said that the Israeli siege is blocking 83% of food aid. Israel's complete siege of Gaza is driving a humanitarian disaster with 83% of required food aid failing to enter the embattled enclave. That's up from 34% not being allowed in in 2023, where the entire population is facing hunger and disease. Almost half of Palestinians are at risk of starvation, an analysis that was just published last Monday revealed. So 15 international aid organizations are saying it. It's not just one. This is a record low average of 69 aid trucks entered into the Gaza Strip every day. I talked about these numbers before compared with the already insufficient 500 truckloads a day. Um, while Israeli military attacks on Gaza have intensified, life-saving food, medicine, medical supplies, fuel, and tents have systematically been blocked from entering uh, for almost a year. The aid groups include Action Aid, American Friends Service Committee, Care International, Christian Aid, Islamic Aid, Oxfam International, and Save the Children. Other findings, 65% of insulin required, half of the required blood supply are not available in Gaza. The availability of hygiene items has dropped to 15% of the amount available in September of 2023. One million women are now going without the hygiene supplies that they need. 1.87 million people are in need of shelter. 1.87 million people are in need of shelter. I mean, the whole population is only 2.2, 2.3 million people. That's the vast majority of people in Gaza. 60% of the homes are destroyed, are damaged as of January, 2024. That's of January. It's been eight, nine months since then. Yet tents for around just 25,000 people have been delivered um, since May, 2024. While humanitarian needs increase, agencies have detailed six main ways their life-saving aid is systematically obstructed on a daily basis. Um, I could just go on and on. And it's just so, oh, it's just so discouraging. Um, the UN um, uh, spokesperson um, said between the 1st and 15th of September, 
of the 94 planned humanitarian missions coordinated with the Israeli authorities for North Gaza, only 37 of 94, or 39%, were facilitated. In South Gaza, just over 50% of the 243 coordinated humanitarian movements were facilitated. Um, she said that OSHA was not able to access northern Gaza at all for a whole 28 days, and aid convoys are being fired at or otherwise exposed to life-risking conditions, stopped or delayed for hours in combat zones. Um, the IDF said that it killed Mohammed Mansour, who had a significant role in the Hamas military intelligence and other operatives in central and south Gaza in the last 24 hours. And the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights to Safe Drinking Water and Sanitation said Monday that Israel's militarization of water in the OPT is a part of what they're calling, quote, a water and territorial apartheid policy, calling Israel's violation of existing international law as the ICJ has established systematic. Palestinians have no access to the Jordan River. They can't build wells or water infrastructure. Um, they only have 70 liters of water per day, and in rural communities, only 20 liters of water per day, while the Israeli population has four times more on average. Illegal settlers receive and use 18 times more water for their crops and swimming pools. In the West Bank, um, an Israeli sniper killed an UNRWA sanitation worker on the roof of his home in the northern West Bank. Um, Safan Jabber Abed Jawad was the first UNRWA employee killed in the West Bank for more than a decade. We talked about that when it happened. He was shot in the early morning, uh, last Thursday morning in the El Farah camp. He left behind a wife and five children. The Israeli military said Jawad was killed by a sniper during an operation in the camp. It said he was throwing explosive devices at troops from his home without providing evidence. It was found that the quote, terrorist was known to Israeli forces and that he'd been complicit in, quote, terrorist activities. UNRWA regularly provides lists of all the staff members in Gaza and the West Bank and was not informed of any concerns about him before he was killed. That was The Guardian reporting. The Washington Re Post reported about that video incident I've been talking about the last couple of days where there was a body thrown off a roof in the West Bank. And uh, the title of the Washington Post article says Israeli forces shove at least four men off a West Bank roof. And there's video proof. The IDF is investigating the episode. Um, of course, I mean, the IDF has said it's against their values. The U.S. is calling for an investigation. You know, I just... Um, it, it feels really hypocritical because Kirby, the spokesperson uh, for the White House, you know, says that this is so disturbing. He says, you know, if the film is found to be legitimate and I, I just I mean, fine. Yes, of course, we should always check the legitimacy of something. But Hamas and militants have committed heinous crimes. That is absolutely true. And we have to condemn them. And I think like that's completely appropriate. But why is there such a double standard when the Israeli military forces do something? So instead of just saying that that's a horrific thing, you know, Kirby has to have this caveat. In terms of Hezbollah, at least 19 people were killed and 66 people were wounded. Lebanese people were wounded in an attack on Beirut by the Israeli forces. Um, that happened on Friday leading into this morning, Saturday, 19 people killed in Lebanon. Um, Hezbollah announced that one of their top commanders, Ahmed Wahbi, uh, who oversaw the Radwan security forces, was killed uh, in an Israeli strike. That happened yesterday. Hezbollah also announced two other deaths of Radwan force commanders. The U.S. said that they stand with Israel in its defense of its people and territory against Hezbollah, but they want to see a diplomatic settlement. Settlement. That was said by Brett McGurk and Biden's administration. He's top, he's a Biden administration's top Middle East advisor at the National Security Council. Reuters reported that the IDF um, has said that they did kill at least 16 Hezbollah members in an Israeli strike in Beirut yesterday on Friday. Israel has closed its airspace in the north due to the security situation after striking Beirut, and the Washington Post reported today that 31 people have died and 68 were injured in the Israeli airstrike that killed two Hezbollah commanders and other members of the group in a Beirut suburb. Um, children were also among the dead. The Israeli military and Hezbollah confirmed the deaths Friday of the senior members I was just speaking of, Ibrahim Achil and Ahmad Wehbi. 
Uh, the strike came as a part of days-long Israeli assault on Hezbollah amid fears of an all-out war, and both sides have continued to exchange fire across, uh, across the border. Um, one of the things we've seen happening quite frequently, and it happened again in the last 24 hours, is that additional fires broke out in North Israel. So firefighting crews are on the scene, nine crews in fact, and sirens went off in North Israel. Um, Netanyahu will depart for the U.S. on Tuesday, um, a day later than planned. He's giving a speech at the U.N. General Assembly next Friday. And um, Israel has submitted an official objection to the International Criminal Court at The Hague. Um, the foreign ministry announced saying that it does not have the jurisdiction to present its case. Um, this is uh, about the chief prosecutor requesting arrest warrants against Netanyahu at Golant and three Hamas leaders. The objection also stated the prosecutor's request is contrary to international law due to the Oslo Accords. In the U.S., Rashida Tlaib criticized her colleagues for their silence against um, Israel's war on Gaza after that 600-page report uh, became public, particularly with the names of pages and pages of children at the beginning of it. Um, American Muslim groups, there's a whole coalition of them that has announced they will not endorse Democratic candidate Kamala Harris in the November presidential election, but instead they're urging support for pro-Palestinian candidates. Um, one, for example, is the Green Party nominee Jill Stein, uh, the Justice for All uh, nominee Cornel West, or others who backed a ceasefire in Gaza and an arms embargo on Israel. And finally, if you receive our Churches for Middle East Peace Bulletin, you should have seen the news about some of our upcoming events. Please join us, host a prayer, um, get your church involved. Uh, October 6th is a Solidarity Sunday. We're supporting those who are advocating for peace. We'll also be having a prayer vigil on the year anniversary of the October 7th attacks. Um, just acknowledging all of the trauma and loss uh, that's happened over the past year and calling people, God willing, by then we'll have a ceasefire, but um, we'll have uh, an online event that day. I also wanted to let you know there's an online conference happening in October called Better Citizens, Better World. It'll be recorded, but you can also watch it live. It's online. It'll be an opportunity to learn more about um, advocacy, um, civic responsibility, but also to be um, to learn more about, you know, a history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and um, to learn more about advocacy opportunities related to the Middle East as well. So may God go before us. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Amen. <laughs>